morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thanks. Um, we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to jump right in. My name is Tom Catalini, and I have a little over one year experience with WordPress.org, the self-hosted version. So I'm an end user, just like a lot of folks in the room. Uh, I know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. I'm happy to help you uh, any way I can. And the purpose of my talk today is simply to share the experience of one guy who's been working with WordPress for about a year. Uh, and I picked the top 10 things that I learned, uh, mostly because that's the first title I thought of, Tom's Top 10, 10 Tips for uh, Blogging with WordPress. Um, <clears throat> the way I've structured the talk, I've got 10 tips to go through in kind of a short amount of time. So it'll be pretty fast paced. I'd like to keep it kind of interactive. You know, just uh, we, we want you to use the microphone so that we can hear your questions or your comments. So if folks know something more than I do about a particular topic, Please you know, get on mic and you'll help everybody by uh, adding your two cents. If you have questions, let me know. Anything we can handle live, we'll do that. I'll also be uh, around later today. I'll be accessible through the contact form of my blog and other means. Um, so I like to keep it interactive. And I'm going to try and structure it so that you know, we're done in 30 minutes or less uh, so that there's time for some Q&A and blog talk at the end. So were a lot of you here for David Wells' presentation this morning about getting started? So at least half of the folks. Okay, so that was a great introductory to how to get up and running. There's a lot of nuts and bolts. And you'll be interested to know his first tip is the same as, uh, as my first tip, if I can get this to work. Oh, I'm sorry, before we get into that, uh, quick overview, we're gonna go kind of around the horn here. Uh, these are the, the 10 things I'm gonna talk about today. Titles, that's the same thing David Wells talked about, so we'll go through that quickly. And I'm going to go in varying depths on each topic. So some things I'm going to try and give you screenshots and step-by-step -step examples and really how to get it done. Other topics I'm going to gloss over because I think they're important that you know about them and maybe put some thought into them, but we just don't have time to get into. Um, so we're going to go through titles, images, writing, uh, making things shareable on social media, which is an entire session on that. Slides will be available. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a speaker rating system, there's a slide share system set up, so I think everybody who's presenting and things are being video recorded. So, so I've tried to give you references and specific plugin names or widget names where I'm sort of glossing over things or moving quickly and screenshots other, in other places. Uh, then I want to talk about tracking your statistics for your website, your traffic, uh, some thoughts on organization, uh, inviting subscribers how to show off your top posts, and then some just ideas on uh, you know, where to get blog ideas and um, some thoughts on scheduling and content management. So uh, David Wells talked about this. I'm going to talk about it just for a minute. You know, when you first set up WordPress, this is one of the first things you should do. Are folks familiar with search engine optimization? Right? You want your stuff to be found by the search engines that are out there. And the reason why this is important is because your URL uh, makes up, it, it, it carries the most weight with a search engine, having your keywords in the URL. So the setting within WordPress, the default setting is that question mark P equals whatever, whatever your post number is. It's really not helpful to you or to anybody else. Um, I'm suggesting the same default that David did to put the post name. That way, whatever your title is maps your URL. So if I've written this blog post, five things CIOs need to know about Google Plus, right in my URL, some keywords like CIOs, Google Plus, are right in there carrying the most weight with what I've published with the search engines that are out there. So, and it, you know, should cause you to put some thought into how you title things and what it is you're talking about um, yeah, can influence that. So that's quickly tip number one. Tip number two uh, is not necessarily WordPress specific, but it's something I feel uh, strongly about as a blog writer and a blog reader. Adding images to your post, to me, makes it just more interesting. It can grab your attention. It can set the tone for the piece. Here I have a title where I'm talking about efficiency is good for business, but not necessarily what makes people happy. Not really a snappy title. I've got some keywords that might help me with SEO, but I like the picture here because it it sort of gets your attention and it, maybe, hey, maybe there's a downside to efficiency, right? So 
that draws you in. So I can't go around and find babies to pose for, for things like this, right? You're trying to get your content out. You're trying to just write something and get it published. So, uh, you know, where do, where do you get these photos um, and do it the right way? Well, you might be familiar with Flickr. It's a photo sharing site on the web. And a lot of this, there's millions and millions of photos up there. And a tremendous amount of them are licensed through Creative Commons. And that's just a way for folks to share things that they've created on the web. And it's very easy to go in there, do an advanced search, and limit your search to only Creative Commons licensed content. This allows you to find stuff that people have said, hey, it's OK if you use it. I encourage you to use it. If you're going to use things, if you're going to um, change that content, if you're going to adapt it, if you're going to use it for commercial purposes, you've got a little more uh, to pay attention to, and you can filter that search a little bit further. And these are the information you can read. There's a lot of information out there on Creative Commons. So let's say I'm not feeling so grumpy about the next post and I want to find a happy face. I might go and search for happy face. And a, a tip for searching around Flickr that I found um, in use over the last year, if I literally wanted a happy face, then I did a pretty good search here, right? Or if I wanted something sort of goofy, I've got that. Maybe that's not what I want. So I find myself using a thesaurus or other means, thinking of other ways to express the same idea. And if I put in excited, maybe this is more what I'm after for this piece. So again, I found another face, and she's certainly happy, but she's also excited. And maybe it conveys happiness, but that's the way I want to use it in my piece. So uh, you got to spend some time with Flickr figuring out what works. There's a question back there if we get a microphone. And then I'm going to show you how to insert it into WordPress. Oh, great. I was just going to say, um, I wonder how you attribute those. Um, the, the, usually the Creative Commons require at least the, the name of the author. And I've been looking for ways that I can satisfy that criteria by putting in uh, the, the correct uh, license and also the, uh, the creator of the title. Yeah, so the minimum requirement for this stuff is attribution, right? So they've got to give the person credit for the work that they've shared with you and the rest of the world. So when I'm inserting this image into a WordPress post, I've got the link to the image. A lot of times, you can download it and upload it to WordPress. A lot of times, I'll just use the, the photo right off of Flickr. Uh, I might use the keyword here. And on the alternative text, you know, when you hover over it and a text pops up, you can put the photo credit. Most of the times in my post, at the bottom of the post, I'll put photo credit, colon, I'll put the person's name or their, their Flickr handle, and I'll include this link. And I'll also link this image back to the post. So if you went to this post as it's configured here and you clicked on the image, you'd actually see the source information out there and that person gets credit. One more slide on this um, that I found handy to, to resize things. The photo you get is not always the right size to fit onto your blog. Uh, handy tip is if you change either the width or the height and leave the other one blank, it will automatically maintain the aspect ratio so the picture doesn't get all stretched out and whatnot. So that's an easy way to do that. And then this is something else I'd like to encourage. Giving it a little bit of uh, breathing room uh, just bothers me when I see a photo and all the text is jammed right up to the edge. It just doesn't look nice. So that's the way that I found worked well for me. Tip number three uh, is really writing stuff. So I got into, you know, created this WordPress blog and I got a couple of other sites and uh, started getting into it. But I realized that there's something different about writing content for the web. There really is for, uh, uh, there really is a bloggy style. And I just noticed that that's the type of stuff I was reading and that I found engaging. And uh, th there's a little bit of a um, bias there that I agree with. So I wrote a whole blog post on this. And I've got the link down here. And that will be available on the slides. But the, the highlights are. You know, don't bury the lead. Tell me what you're going to tell me, and then tell it to me, right? So it's like a newspaper article. It's not some grand piece of work, and I want to wait for the surprise ending at the end. People aren't going to stick around. They're going to move off to the next thing. So don't bury the lead. Yet, unlike a newspaper, use a conversational tone. So a lot of times when I'm creating blog content, I'm imagining that I'm speaking to you, and I'm just recording that. It's a more natural way to speak. Uh, it's important to be brief and to the point. You know, the attention span, I think, for depending on what your blog is, right? This doesn't apply to everybody. But I think the attention span tends to be shorter in, uh, in the blogosphere. And breaking things up visually is another reason why I use the images. 
So just when you pull up the page, you sort of got the idea, maybe the tone of what's going to happen on this post, and it breaks things up visually. It doesn't look hard to read, so the image helps there. Subtitles help, you know, little bold subtitles, some white space, maybe adding some more images, anything to make it look not so daunting to read. Um, varying sentence length and loosening up the grammar grip, that's simply writing like you speak, right? I end a preposition, uh, I'm sorry, end a sentence with a preposition every time I speak, so why not just type it that way? I start sentences with and when I speak, so what's the big deal? It's really not a big deal, and it makes it easier to read, more natural, more personal. So those are my, my thoughts on uh, writing tips. Okay, tip number four uh, when I was thinking about this. Okay, so we've set up WordPress, we've at least done the minimal SEO optimization, we've got a snappy title, we've got some great content, a good picture that represents that. It's, a, it's an engaging piece. Somebody finds it and they like it, we should make it easy to share it with others. And there's a lot happening in social media, as you know, it's no surprise. So this is what I've done and sort of honed in on over the year. These are the specific plugins that can be configured and added to WordPress so that it just is automatically put onto each post you create. So the Google plus one adds a button to plus one it in the Google system. The tweet meme retweet button adds this retweet button. Uh, Sociable adds a whole bunch of them. I'm probably gonna actually take this down. I'm not sure people uh, use that very much or, or are into sort of you know, clicking through to some and getting a list of options and then sharing it. I tend to favor these buttons simply because that's what I use more. If I can just click it once, okay, I wanna tweet it, fine, I'm done, I'm going on to something else and the Facebook light. So I like these sort of big buttons that are simple. And in the world of WordPress, um, you know, it's very easy to get this stuff. You know, the Google Plus One thing is pretty new. And that's one of the things I like about WordPress is, you know, almost immediately folks are creating plugins to allow you to add this capability. We have a question down here. We're just gonna wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you. And I tend to put these at the bottom of every post and I just don't wanna be too noisy. This is just my style, you can do whatever you want. So figuring if you've got to the bottom and you decided you like it, maybe that's when you're gonna agree to share it. I turn it off for pages. A lot of these are configurable. You can have it on or off, you know, on for just posts or for pages and posts. And uh, you know, the bigger buttons I like better and tweet meme allows you to include it in RSS. So sorry, the question over here? Yeah, I was just gonna add, um, you know, there's a couple of plugins that incorporate all of these into one as well. Uh, okay. It used to be ShareBar was a great one, but uh, has kind of fallen off lately. But uh, Get Social is another good one and it organizes them all into one column. Uh, similar to, you see on Mashable, it kind of floats on that left-hand side and you can edit it accordingly. Okay, great. Uh, but it's a good way to incorporate all of those and you can add in other buttons if you and want And that's well. called Get It's social. called Get Social. So then I can configure plus one, retweet, and like all in one it's, thing. Uh, all it, that stuff, it, it's, uh, pl the defaults are plus one, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Dig, StumbleUpon, uh, and then you can add in codes for like Reddit uh, or any of the other uh, and can you uncheck if you didn't want you can to? You can uncheck what you want. Okay, and, so, and it looks the same to the end user? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just it's a, it's a bar on the side, and if you scroll down, it kind of floats down with you. Um, Great. So if you, go, if, you, if you go on Mashable, they have a very similar one. This kind of replicates it. Great, so. thank you. Thank you very much. Didn't know about that. Um, so I like the concept. Maybe that's an easier way to do it, one-stop plug-in shopping. So along with making the content easy, if somebody likes it, make it uh, easy for them to share. Um, another thing that I found that I liked is just automatically tweeting it out, whether it's under my account or I have a cycling blog where I set up a separate Twitter account and it's apparent that, hey, I'm just, I'm just tweeting out the blog post, right? And people will follow that. Maybe they like to consume content that way. They're not RSS readers or they don't browse over your site. So for a lot of reasons, uh, I found it's handy to get your content out automatically to Twitter every time you make a post. So I'm using this WP to Twitter plugin. It's got tons of options. There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. You can, you know, prefix your post with. Um, you could have it say blog post colon and then whatever you want. There's tons of different options. I keep it very simple for me. This is what I'm doing. Is I just put the title and the URL out on my main Twitter account, and then uh, it's out there. So folks who follow me on Twitter are aware of that, and that's actually where a lot of my traffic comes from. And I wouldn't be surprised if for a lot of people. That's where a lot of the traffic comes from. 
When you do some things like that to integrate to these third-party services, there's some authorization, right? So before Twitter is going to let some system post on your behalf, it's going to want to make sure that you're aware and agree to this. So there's a little bit of copying and pasting all these complicated codes. If you go to install something like this, the steps really aren't that bad. It's going to look sort of nasty and daunting. But if you actually walk through the steps, you're going to Twitter, you're creating a code, you copy it, you paste it back, and so forth. And the same thing with your URL shortener, whether it's bit.ly or, or something else. So that's uh, what I have found, one of my tips that I found helpful. Um, another one that was talked about this morning was uh, you know, tracking your traffic. And if you're just starting out, you know, maybe you don't have a lot of traffic, but this is, again, something that's easy to set up and configure, and it gives you a wealth of information down the road. Are folks familiar with Google Analytics at all? Okay, yeah, well, just a few folks. So Google Analytics, if you're not familiar with it, is, gives you incredible insight into the traffic, the amount of traffic coming to your website, where it comes from, how much of your traffic is coming from search engines versus people coming directly there versus other sites referring you, and even in that search engine traffic, it will tell you what did people type in the search engine to get there. So it's very useful information for you to gather and know. It'll tell you what operating system they're using, what web browser they're using. You know, you can get into a whole sort of study on this. But what I'm telling you is don't worry about that yet. Just set this up so whatever traffic you get is at least being collected. You can analyze it later. And again, you have to go to an outside service, google.com slash analytics. You set up a Google account if you don't have one. It gives you a code. It does some things to prove that you own that URL, right? Because you can't track the traffic for somebody else's website. So it goes through some pretty uh, simple steps there. And then you need to plug it into WordPress. Um, oh, I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. But the um, Google Analytics for WordPress is the plugin that I'm using on this site. So that's a plugin. Uh, I think David talked about this morning, editing a certain PHP file. I don't know how to do that. I went to the wonderful world of WordPress, uh, WordPress uh, user community, found a plugin that could do this. And it was very simple for me to just copy that code from Google Analytics and put it in there. So totally advocate for this. At the same time, I also advocate for the stats feature from WordPress.com. So you can go to WordPress.com, set up an account, and use their stats engine. It is not as deep and detailed as what you get from Google Analytics, but it shows up right in your dashboard. So right when you're in there working on your site, you can get a sense of the traffic that's coming to your site. You can get some information on who's referring traffic to your site, what are your top posts and pages. You can do the last week or month or year or whatever. So it's not as detailed, but it's awfully handy. What I find is, you know, I'll take a peek at this, and I rarely look at the Google Analytics, but I have it in case I need it, in case, you know, for some reason there's something I'm curious about, I can do the, the, the deeper analytics. Okay, this was helpful to me, uh, organizing the blog. So I started out blogging, and through the... Uh, WordPress users group in Boston, the, the meetups that happen over at the Nerd Center, I um, went to a session where folks would give you some feedback on your blog design. And one of the, you know, the, the best feedback I got is, well, all right, you pull it up, put it on the screen in front of, in front of you know, 40 or 50 people there, they're like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do? And it made it apparent to me to sort of see my own blog from fresh eyes that, yeah, that's interesting your current post is out there, but what about all the other stuff you created? Creating a little bit of a menu system can be a nice way to just tell people that there's other stuff on there, right? Instead of scrolling down. And if you decide on some certain categories, and I went back and looked at my site and figured out, well, there are some themes that I follow through. Not every blog post falls into a category, but enough do that I could, you know, make a credible crack at uh, making a menu system that would point people to content they might be interested in. So instead, if they're not interested in that current post, maybe they can browse around and look at things. In WordPress, it's very easy. You can categorize your posts, and then you can build menus off of those categories. So here's one. I did a uh, series on Website 101, which is you know uh, all the basic stuff to basically set up WordPress. Um, and if you click on that menu item on my site, all those posts automatically show up. And you can even configure the category within WordPress so that 
you know, the headline shows up on the top of that page in the introductory content if you want to add a little bit of context to it. So it's a real simple way to do it without taking a lot of trouble. And it add, you know, for me, it added some depth to the page. And there was a little bit more to browse around and look at once you got to my site. Um, once you've created those categories, you go over to the menu system in WordPress and you add the categories to the menu system and then it's just drag and drop. You put in the order you want, you can make sub-menus, uh, really couldn't be much easier. And under appearance menus, you add that. Okay, so now we're cooking, we've got some great content, people are sharing it, traffic's coming in. Maybe some of these folks are so interested that they want to be a regular subscriber to your website. Are folks familiar with RSS subscriptions? Not too many. So RSS is, is basically a way to subscribe to a blog. It's a pretty common way that a lot of folks will consume your content. So you want to make that easy for them. WordPress has this capability built in. Um, I funnel my traffic through FeedBurner, which gives a little, it does a little bit of cleanup work. And it gives me, again, more stats. Not that I really spend a lot of time looking at them, but I just wanted to be collecting them out of the gate. Hi, just on the, on the previous tip, number seven, I was wondering why would you use menu, menus for your categories rather than just an archive system in the sidebar? What are, what are uh, maybe what you see as the, the advantages to that? I think you could, you, could do, you could do whatever you like, right? So you mean on, the si on top versus on the sidebar? It's a design decision. What I found when I got reviewed by the users group is like, hey, it's not really apparent what to do on your website. And I thought that was the most obvious place to put those categories of themes I normally write on. And in a minute, we're going to see I put some different things on the sidebar. So the sidebar is where I put like the RSS feed, you know, follow me on Twitter, that sort of stuff. And then I've got um, some other widgets. We have another. Uh, The great thing about menus is that you can uh, create a very robust hierarchical structure. So you can actually uh, create a very sophisticated mini sitemap, so to speak, right where people expect to find it, which is in a menu. It's a very obvious type of uh, search tool without having to go in any great effort on your part. And would you agree a lot of people maybe use both even, right? I've seen oh, yeah, two there's, navigation systems There's no reason why you can't on. use both. It, and, and isn't that really the point of, of, of working with a good interface is that there's redundant features? People are looking where they're, where they're used to looking, not where you necessarily point them. So if you have places that are often used by a lot of other websites, then that's really where you should be putting your, your information. OK, and I think we had another question back there. But So I'm running everything through um, Google's feed burner, burner service, which you know has some sort of clean up, clean up capabilities. It allows for email subscriptions. We'll do a ping shot to notify services that might be interested that there's some new RSS info out there. There's a socialized feature to auto-tweet through this service as well. I found that problematic for me. I don't know if anybody's found a way to fix that, but um, that's why I use the other plugin. Yeah, back to our question over here. So on FeedBurner, uh, we've just never really understood. Uh, does it tell you how many people are subscribed to an RSS feed or how many times their server pings your server. I, looking into it, we got confused. Yeah, it's confusing to me as well. So it tells you the number of subscribers, not only on email, but on RSS subscriptions. But it changes. And I've read a lot of blog posts on this. So your subscriber counts go up and down. It's, it, it's like an indicator, a general sense of what's going on. I think, I imagine it's a hard thing for them to track okay. accurately. But I've seen a lot of folks say, hey, every Sunday morning my count goes down, and then Monday it comes back up. And just a quick follow so in that case, it would actually give you, so we're worried that we'll lose whoever subscribed already, but actually you're saying it's, it's more of a live check. So it would tell us even people who subscribed in the first few months of our blog and not just from today going forward. Yeah, so if you make this change, you are changing for new subscribers would go through this service. So the way that, oh, but not old. Okay. yeah, the way that this works, and this is why I'm suggesting maybe for folks who are doing this out of the gate, I think your situation might be a little trickier. The way this works is, WordPress is feeding out on this URL. 
I'm asking uh, FeedBurner to take in that URL and serve it out this way. Right, so I'm funneling my posts through FeedBurner out to the world. Then I, I gotta come back to my site and say, okay, WordPress, instead of handing out this information when people subscribe, hand out this feed. If you use a theme like I happen to on this site that supports that, it's just a configuration option. If not, there's a, uh, this plugin seems to get great reviews, this FD FeedBurger plugin. So how to make that transi transition, I'm not exactly sure how you'd preserve everybody cleanly and seamlessly. Maybe there's a way to alert them, ask them to resubscribe or something like that, or somebody else might have a tip on that. Uh, so along the lines of subscription, this uh, plugin I thought was cute. What would Seth Godin do? And the idea is, you know, somebody's visiting your site, you have an opportunity to maybe engage them at the next level. And so this is trying to be clever and invite people to subscribe, maybe right at the top, you can put it at the bottom of your blog post. And you can customize this text. If you're new here and you like it, why don't you subscribe? What I like is you can configure it to say, oh, you know what? It, it can tell that you're a first time here or you're new here. And it will track, hey, let's ask them the first two, three, four, five times that they visit and then we will stop bothering them. So I thought that was a nice balance between sort of, you know, if somebody's a regular reader of your site to keep bothering them every time to subscribe, maybe they're already a subscriber. I thought this was a good way to do it. So those are my two things I liked on subscriptions. Um, so this is a piece I put in my sidebar. This is, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the most popular posts on your blog? And I was doing this in different ways before I discovered this plugin, which was uh, incredibly valuable. So on the right-hand sidebar, I have the top posts, and they're automatically calculated by this post rank plugin. And it, it takes into consideration the amount of traffic, people who are uh, tweeting about this, so on and so forth. I don't really know the ins and outs of their algorithm. I know that it was good enough for me to give folks who come to the front page another indicator, some social proof. All right, when I come here, what am I supposed to do? Well, this is the content that other people have found useful when they came here, so maybe that's interesting to you. And it just gives them more navigation options when they get to the front page of your site. So again, this is, uh, you know, you go to uh, the add plugins area, you search for post rank, you add it in to the widgets area, and you just drag it into the sidebar. Very easy to do, and it, it added a lot of uh, functionality to the site. We have a question up front if we get the microphone, and then we'll get on to the last tip. I'm sorry, what's the difference between a widget and a plugin? What is the difference between a widget and a plugin? Somebody else here probably could give you a better answer. Uh, widgets, you know, my interpretation is the widgets are the things I'm putting on my sidebar, and the plugins are adding features and functionality to the site that may show up anywhere. Does anybody have a better definition than that? That's good? Okay. All right. All right, I got lucky. All right. Um, tip number 10, post ideas and scheduling. I wanted to pontificate a little bit more about blogging in general. Uh, because I found as I made a commitment to just sort of going through the exercise over the last year that it's, it, it's easy but it's not easy. Um, and what I found is, if, you know, ideas for a blog post. So you're going to start a blog, what am I going to write about? And you have different ideas and that's probably going to change over time. You know, ideas can come from anywhere. And, um, you know, a lot of times you can capture them. A lot of times I'll just, you know, pen and paper is a good place to start. Um, uh, you know, on a notebook, whatever you're comfortable with, on your smartphone, wherever. But the most important thing I found was just building a habit of writing. You know, the more you write, the easier it gets. The more you build that habit, that discipline. I found that I was able to create more content more consistently, and I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's gotten better. Oh, and the last bullet point is about editing your own work, and this is something that is always a little bit mysterious to me but this is what happens, right? So I might work on something, and I have to get used to editing it. So I like the preview feature in WordPress because I might type up and have everything, I think, done. I'll preview it, and it just looks a little different. All of a sudden, I'll notice something I didn't see in the editor. And almost every time after it's published, I subscribe to my own RSS feed, right? So I get, <laughs> I get the post in, and every time I go, ah, there's a typo. There's a, you know, something I didn't see no matter how many times I review and edit. And in WordPress, what's nice is you can go back and, and easily edit in these, uh, these systems that will publish your RSS feed. We have a question over here. 
um, are smart enough not to republish that post to everyone. So you, you know, the first people, they're going to get the typo, the rest of the folks uh, won't. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, I also had another suggestion. Um, um, a lot of the fonts, the default fonts and you know, a lot of the WordPress themes are really small. And if you're 22 years old, that's not a problem. If you're 56 like me, that is. So if, if it's possible, if your theme supports it, a larger font would get you a lot of appreciation from uh, readers who wear glasses or just whose eyes are not as young as they once were. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that would fall into the category of just making it appealing. You know, making it look easy to read. Like, that's why I put the images and the white space and the subtitles and, and big text, absolutely. So my theme does support that, and I think I have a decent size font. Not quite as big as this font here today. But. Um, so the drafts, sometimes folks don't notice this. There's a draft button right there. You can have 8, 10, 12 different draft posts going. WordPress doesn't care. It's not going to share it with anybody until you publish it. Along those lines with developing and managing content, scheduling. So you can also, let's say you go, you've committed to, you know, once a week I'm going to write a blog post or two or three times a week. How the heck am I going to keep up with that? I get other things to do. You can write in advance. As long as you're not writing a news site where you've got to get the breaking news of the day, chances are you can probably create your content well in advance, get it all set up the way you, you like, and then schedule it for a few days in advance. So that's another tip that I've, I've found useful. Okay, so we've got five or ten minutes, I think, for Q&A. We've got a question over here. I'll answer anything I can. Hi, as someone who uh, has not launched a blog or a website yet, I'm just curious of all these tools, plugins, widgets, whatever you're talking about there that you think are of value, uh, how much of those are, are fee-based? In other words, subscription month over month, what, what's fee? And basically, what does it cost to have your site running month to month? What, what would be the operating fees if we followed your model and used all the widgets and plugins you got there? It ain't going to cost you much, I'll tell you that. So I, I spent a few dollars on a premium theme that uh, is called Thesis, and it might have been 70 bucks. You know, and um, whatever article I read at the time about why I did that, I don't even remember, but it's a, you know, a nice-looking theme. It gives me control over the fonts. It has some, some nice features. The rest of this is all free stuff from the WordPress community. The hosting, I use similar services to what David Wells talked about this morning. I think it maybe used to be 5 bucks a month. Maybe it's $10 a month now, and you can even put multiple sites on there. So it's, it's incredibly cost-effective. When you uh, send a post, tweet a post, how does it, if Twitter is only 144 characters, what do you, do you have to write out a special uh, you know, title? Does it, does it just tweet the title, or how do you do that? So I'm just tweeting the title, okay. and, uh, and it'll cut it off, and it'll put the URL, but that's worthy of some thought when you're creating. So creating a blog post title is like an art to itself, right? So I've configured the URL. I want some keywords in there. But I also want to maybe put a Twitter spin on it sometimes. You know, there are certain different types of titles that people will respond to, you know, four things you should know about WordPress or, you know, whatever that, that fit into that. So I'm really making, I think, short titles where I'm going longer. They're just getting cut off. But there's in this uh, plugin, there's a ridiculous amount of options, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was some way to, you know, actually configure that. Thank you. I'm wondering, is there a way to kind of fudge the dates on posts? Yes. <laughs> you know of? Like I have done that many times. <laughs> I have a bunch of posts that I wanted to get up earlier in the summer, and now I, you know, they won't look right if I put them up now. But I'd love them to be on the site as posts, not pages. So that date, you can put any date you want. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, great. Yes, and it becomes. Uh, it becomes a little funky if you're trying to get things to sort a certain way, depending on what you're doing with your website, but you can put anything you want in Thank there. You. There's another question out back. Just got a couple of minutes left. Hi, it's not so much a question, it's just a uh, comment. Um, working with people, uh, the word subscription is a scary word. Um, if you are going to put something in subscription, subscribe to this website. If you can put just a little something underneath it that says a subscription is free, basically you're just kind of logging into the website to get that. But subscription is always a scary word because outside of this room, out there, people hear the word subscription and 
they think they're thinking money. Okay? And a lot of people just don't know that a subscription to a website is simply just knowing when an update is coming. So if you can kind of change that wording, that verbiage right there on your front page, subscribe, it's free, click here, it's free, that, that would really help you get more uh, subscribers to your blog. I, I, think that's a great, I think that's a great point. Nobody knows what the hell RSS is either. You know, it's, it's like this great technology with a horrible, horrible name. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Really simple syndication means something to the person creating content, but to the end user, it doesn't really mean anything. One more? Uh, someone or, had mentioned it earlier, uh, Twitter, uh, sending out uh, posts via Twitter. There's a website called twitterfeed.com. Uh, it's a free service. It automatically shortens and adds a URL to anything that comes off of your RSS feed for your website. It's what I personally use on my site. It's a good service, and it sends it to your Twitter on your schedule, half hour, one hour, daily, weekly. Great. Thanks for that. I'm gonna gonna wait for the microphone. So we got one more up front after that. If you use the images that you're talking about to kind of jazz up your blog, how do you how are you sensitive to the mobile community? Are there concerns? Um, so I have added a plugin to my website, and I can't remember the name of it, but there are there's stuff out there. So you come across this stuff in WordPress. Somebody's created a solution for it. That's what I enjoy. So there's somebody that will automatically reformat your site in the optimal way for mobile. And there's another one for um, the iPad. Does anybody know what that's called? They did it on WordPress.com. Any WordPress.com blog, if you look at it from an iPad, it's automatically formatted like a flipboard type swiping experience. And there are themes like that for, I'm sorry, plugins like that that will solve for mobile as well. And if you've put in Google Analytics, you can go back and see exactly how many people are viewing your site from mobile. That's another good reason to have that. Okay. If you uh, post a URL for a photo from Flickr, do you have to worry about the person who posted the photo changing the URL or taking it down? You do, and it happened to me once, but I still haven't learned my lesson and I keep just linking to the URL be just because it's quicker and easier. But it did happen to me once, and I forget which post and if I even fixed it, but it's, once it's gone, it's gone. One minute to go, okay. I've got about two years of uh, blog posts, and uh, I didn't uh, do the item you talked about in the very first point of, of customizing your um, URL. Your link. Yep. Uh, so what happens if I choose that? I've used a lot of uh, internal links linking back to previous posts as well as you know putting them in other locations. Okay, so if you change the permalinks now and you've already got a ton of content, my understanding is when you change that setting, it changes on a go-forward basis. So the, 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 the permanent link for each post created in the past remains unchanged. Then you've got to do this permanent redirect thing if you really want to deal with that, which I, you know, my cycling blog was you know, it's like six or seven years old now, and I upgraded it from Blogger to WordPress. And I got into this a little bit. I think I found a plugin that would not only redirect from your old URL. This is if you want to do it. You can just leave it alone. But if you wanted to do this, you can redirect from uh, your old URL to the new one. But there's a certain type of redirect that's called permanent, and it goes back and tells the search engine to stop looking for the first one and to find the second one. Is there any way that I can, is there like a safety net or something like that that I can use for testing this before I actually make it live so that if I don't like what it did, I can sort of undo it? Yeah, you're getting over my head oh. on that question, I'd say. So you might want to stop by the expert zone and talk to somebody who knows more about it. I did it a while ago with my cycling blog, but it was nothing that I was that concerned about at the end of the day. So I didn't have a test environment or any kind of, any kind of thing like that hooked up. So I would be careful with it. Okay, we're done. <laughs> I got the sign. <laughs> Thank you.